Welcome to the Palette Talks podcast. Hello, everyone. My name is Jason, and you're listening to the Palette Talks podcast. In this episode, we're joined by a talented lo-fi music producer. It's the one and only Nick Wolf, everyone. Hey, man. So glad to have you on the show. Hey, Jason. It's nice to be here, man. Awesome. Awesome. So how is it going, man? It's going pretty well. I mean, you know, ups and downs with COVID and we've got a fight yeah. going on here for like, you know, racial equality and police brutality. But things are overall going pretty well. All right. So uh, to kick things off, why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are, where are you from, and what do you do? And we'll go on from there. Okay. Well, my name is Nick Wolf. Um, first and foremost, I guess I make music, uh, but I also play competitive video games. I like to cook. I like to spend time with my friends. Um, I'm from Baltimore, Maryland. That's great. I didn't know that you are a competitive video gamer. That's yeah. That's how... so, <laughs> you know what? What was that? Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, I've heard you bring up video games a couple times on previous episodes of the, of the uh, podcast. I heard the Wordbound guys actually talking about how oh, video no. games... I know where this is going. <laughs> <laughs> because I heard them talking about how video games were like unproductive for them, which I know is the case for a lot of people. But for me, I have like a pretty high... I don't know, I have, I have like a big competitive itch. And when I was younger, I filled it with sports. And it just kind of naturally led it into doing like competitive gaming. Yeah, I mean like... Um, well, so what do you play? Uh, I primarily play a game called Overwatch, uh, ah, which is like yeah. a first-person shooter with like almost like cartoony, futuristic mm. uh, visuals. So uh, uh, I saw Valorant the other day. Did you check that out yet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It looks like a cool game. It's it's like um, a little bit more shootery than mm. Overwatch is, which is like a game that has a lot of different concepts from other games blended into it. Yeah, one thing that stood out the most for me for Overwatch is the nostalgia with Team Fortress 2 because I played, I used mm. to play TF2 and and um, I love how they, it's it's more fun for me. Like, it, it's not as, you know, when you see CS and Valorant, it probably will feel more, I don't know, rigid or, you know, yes. it's, it's like very rough, but in... Yes. in in Overwatch, there are like a lot of strategies, the different abilities and stuff. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's what attracts me to the game. I like, I could call you like a brain game, and I play a role in the game that is like it requires, it demands a lot of different things from you, and I appreciate that. Awesome, and um, I really love um, seeing different aspects of different things such as let's say gaming i'm a huge fan of esports i don't yeah. really play a lot of games but i really admire like the amount of hard work people put in the amount yeah. of effort and practice and 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 it's just astounding for me to see people really like people think playing especially competitive video gaming really easy they thought but it's it's not as easy as how it looked like right oh yeah of course. I mean, these guys end up putting in, like, I know for the game that I play, like, the minimum that a lot of these players put in is, like, 10, 12, 14 hours a day. Yeah, so, so are you part of a team, if you don't mind? I, <laughs> I was about a year ago, and I was, it was while I was working full-time, so doing it was kind of actually a big problem for me, um, because I kind of just got, like, sucked into it, dropped, mm. like, any sense of a social life was playing the game like 10 hours a day. Wow. Yeah. But yeah, I enjoyed you... it. It was nice. Well, you nice enjoyed it, so yeah, it's fair enough. <laughs> yeah, that yeah, was fun to compete. So um, I'm, I'm really fascinated with the fact that you actually play uh, competitive gaming, which is a very interesting topic to talk about. Um, so how did you first get into it? 
you know, we're going to talk about music in a moment, but I'm truly curious about this. So how <laughs> sure, did yeah, you absolutely. come up with this? Uh, the way I got into it was I was playing Overwatch for a while and I just wasn't getting like better at the game. And for someone who I have like a, because of the competitive drive I have, that was very frustrating for me. Um, and I started looking into ways to improve and me and my roommate stumbled upon a league that was meant for players who were not very good at the game, <laughs> which we were not very good at the game at all. We were pretty terrible actually. Uh, but there was like a draft for this league and we did tryouts and we i guess looked okay enough to get into this you know crappy league and mm-hmm. we got drafted onto this team me and my roommate both um that was ran by a former uh army and u.s air force translator slash pilot uh he had done a couple uh deployments and he like ran the team like he was in charge of a military unit right and it was actually great for all of us. Uh, we all improved a ton under under his watch, and we ended up all getting a lot better and graduating the league and going on to like higher ranks of gameplay. Um, and there was this one character that I specialized in uh, that was very useful for like the way that the game was played. Uh, so I tried out for like higher rank teams and. Even though I was pretty low rank compared to all the people that I was trying out against, because I was pretty good at the character, I ended up getting a shot on a bunch of teams. Mm. And I landed on this one team, and I don't know, we competed in a couple tournaments. Uh, We didn't win, but we were playing for like small amounts of money. You're like, dude, you're practicing like 10 hours a day for like a $500 (laughs) prize pool, you know? It's like kind of, it's, there's a certain there's a certain point where you have to realize like that you don't have exactly what it like I'm not going to be a professional player. I had to realize that at some point, especially while working full time. There's just no way. So mm-hmm. I just decided that it would be healthier for me to not <laughs> compete on a team. So now I, I just play it kind of casually, but yeah, that's the story of how I got there too. That's really cool. So um one thing that I found uh, really interesting about this is the fact that th- the amount of competitiveness um especially in, in, in video, I would say in Overwatch. And when you compare that, uh, or esports, I would say in general, uh, compared to music, which is very competitive as well. Um, sure. So you've been a, a competitive gamer and you, you have also been a music producer. So what are similarities that you have seen, you know, between these two different um, aspects, different elements, right? Music and games, not games, esports. Okay, esports and music. Like, what are some similar similarities that you uh, saw in these two different things? You know what? That that's a great question. Um, I think the first and most obvious thing is that I feel like uh, uh, this is this might sound weird, but I feel like I have I had no talent for Overwatch, and I feel like I had no talent like to start with, no natural talent to start with for music. Um, I actually, I was just talking about this with one of the Wordbound guys. Uh, They're great, by the way. I love those guys. Shout out to them. (laughs) Um, But I feel like, uh, basically, to me, talent implies that you have some sort of, like, natural inclination towards something or the ability to pick it up quickly. And that was not the case for me with competitive gaming and, uh, or with music. And with music, I've been doing that for, like, uh six years or so and i really sucked for like the first five (laughs) but i'm a very like i'm very persistent when i latch onto something i just you know keep doing it um and that's what i did with both of them and got better over time um yeah i think that's the that's the most obvious thing now i'm curious like uh there have been this i would say controversies but like these arguments between nature and nurture right mm-hmm. and you talked about the fact that you have no talents with both competitive gaming and music but you kind of learn you know you got kind of yeah. learn about it you know and um so what do you think do you think that um natural talent exists do you think that like the seed exists or do you think it's something that everyone can pick up yeah i'm not 
I'm not really sure about like the actual science of that, but mm. I don't know. There's different there's different kinds of people in this world, and there's a lane for everybody. You know, there's a way for everybody to get to what they want. But like, do you think that the learning part plays a bigger role than like the seed part or like the nature part? Do you think that the nurture plays a bigger role? Like, just your opinion. You know, you don't need to go over science, of course. <laughs> no, no. Than, but like, as uh, from your experiences, like, do you think because a lot of people, I saw a lot of people, yeah. they don't want to try new things or different things because they said that they don't have that talent right they use right. it as an excuse yeah. when there are many skills that you can actually learn right even though you have no experience at all right but you mm -hmm. can actually learn it about it and so for the people out there that have those kind of excuses like to not try because they say like oh that's not my talent like that's not what i am good at so what do you say to them I would say it's I don't, it's not it's not so much about like what you're good at. It's pretty rare that you'll be good at something right when you start. And we don't. Some people just I don't know. They 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 refuse to let themselves enjoy something that they're not immediately good at. But mm -hmm. I don't I don't think it makes sense. I think if it's something that you think you're going to enjoy or you do enjoy but you're not quite good at it yet, you just do it for the fun of it. And through repetition, you get better. Yeah, practice makes perfect. Absolutely, mm -hmm. dude. And that's so ever true, especially when you train ten hours a day, right? Yeah, and for music, I you know I put thousands of hours in. Like I'm, yeah. I'm probably like five thousand hours in or so, and I can get a lot better. And that's really cool. So I'm actually interested now about music. Um, so how did you first pick up playing music and then eventually start producing it? Like when did that happen? For you. That happened when I was about 17 years old. I actually never played anything before I produced. Produ I started wow. producing without any musical background at all. Actually, music wasn't even really a big part of my life in any way because I grew up in like a pretty strict uh, Orthodox religious home. Mm -hmm. And listening to music that was like outside of our religion was kind of like forbidden. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have, I had to like steal a, a radio when I was like a little kid from my dad and like try to listen to music that way and i always loved music i just didn't have great access to it uh, uh when i was like 17 about uh one of my friends got into producing and i was just like hey that's pretty cool like you can do that I, this is like i never seen anything like it before and it immediately attracted me so i just started so you actually didn't had you didn't have any experience or like skills to play music but you start producing yeah oh and in the beginning it was just it was horrifying man it was terrible yeah. <laughs> I, I still have like i have songs i've like saved on my google drive from like when i started making music and they are terrible dude <laughs> they're bad <laughs> yeah but, but that's a very interesting point that you make that um every i believe that everyone has their own journey like there is i wouldn't say like especially for music there's no right way of doing it at first especially so everybody has their own origin stories right but it's interesting that you actually produce first then you learn music along the way yeah. uh, and and i think that brings in a lot of expectations right like uh, different expectations and different mindsets that you had initially uh, about music and so um what 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 actually first inspired you to like i might not understand a lot about music but i want to start produce um so first of all i just i have always been like i've always loved music even though i, I guess actually it's probably a function of not having great access to it as a kid it was part of mm. why i was like so thirsty to absorb everything music related um my mom once i was like a teenager she showed me a tribe called quest and she used to like play me like old rolling stone songs and stuff mm -hmm. and that's where i like first started getting into into music i listened to a lot of tribe called quest and then i listened to a bunch of nas like nas was my favorite and i loved all of nas's producers and i would listen to all their stuff um and so that's what i was trying to like kind of recreate when i started producing i wanted to do like hip-hop 
but I wanted to add like some more like modern elements, I guess, because I was also mm-hmm. into electronic music. Uh, yeah, that's where it started for me. Dope, dope. So what? Th- so at first you start listening to some music, right? You started yeah. to listen to some music and you try to recreate it, but you want to do it in a different way, in a more yeah. modern way. And but of course, now I know you as a low vi music artist, or yeah. at least I, I know you as that for now. But like, what what motivates you to go into lo fi? What makes you think like I think I want to go make low vi music? Yeah, good question. That's actually just I think a natural progression of my music taste like because i was so into hip-hop and like the people that were producing hip-hop that made a lot of like jazzy and i guess in a sense it's lo-fi uh stuff just because it's early 90s they're producing you know on npcs um and so my taste kind of took me there i got into lo-fi music and i decided i wanted to make it gradually over time i've made like a bunch of different styles of music, but here we are at lo-fi nice so so when did you first release your uh lo-fi music when when was the first release uh the first thing that was like really lo-fi i guess was get better soon which was the first release that i worked with you on uh, yeah. but i guess the song some of the songs that came before that it's all a lot of like uh down tempo stuff mm-hmm. but I, there's always like little bits of lo-fi in them like i feel like my music generally just sits somewhere at the crossroads of like lo-fi, down tempo, ambient, and like instrumental hip hop, that kind of stuff. Yeah, and definitely when we're talking about music, there's I I don't believe in like you can box them in genres, but I think ultimately every artist has their own kind of vibe into it, and so you will mix genres. You'll you will put some elements of different genres, then you put into lo-fi, especially lo-fi is is it's not just your traditional um lo-fi hip-hop right now we've seen a lot of different nuances towards it and i think particularly for me it's what makes lo-fi music so colorful which is like one of the reasons why i uploaded a lot of different tracks different nuances to uh the palatism page is the fact that i don't want people to be honest just to listen to one type of music and just a little bit of history. One of the reasons why I put uh, Palatism as the name of the brand is because I want people to understand that, you know, just like life or just like a palette that has many different colors, I want people to understand that there are many different types of music and each type of music will make you feel different. So don't just listen like, that's okay if you want to listen to just one genre or one particular type of music, but I would encourage people to listen to different types of music. And I think uh, for me, especially, it, it helps me to see things from a different perspective. Like I've, I've listened to a lot of different genres, um, you know, from K-pop to a little bit of hip hop to pop to like uh, mm. really, known really you were a weeb. weird. No. <laughs> yeah, and I, I love J pop as well because I love anime and and uh but yeah it's just interesting for me that uh I think a lot of artists should experiment with different types of genres and be on the crossroads, you know. Yeah, absolutely. First of all, you're the best dude. I, I was wondered I was wondered like what your where your name came from. That's a good story. Uh, I like that. Um and yeah, I can't imagine only listening to one kind of music. Uh, mm. Like, I, dude, I know people that tell me like, "Oh, I don't listen to music," and I can't imagine that. Like, that to me is such a foreign concept. Not to you know put them down or anything. Just it's a very foreign concept. For me. Yeah, yeah, it feels very foreign. It's definitely, like, I don't know. I cannot imagine someone not listening to music. It's, yeah, right. It's like, but you know what? Something that's interesting is that I, I never saw my mom listening to music, which is something very interesting. That she is- watches she watches movies, she watches TV shows, she watches the news, but she, I never saw her opening Spotify or you know YouTube um, one hour mix. You know, I've <laughs> never seen her. I wonder why that is. 
That's interesting. Yeah, it's, it's always been interesting, but I've never actually asked her that. So how did you but, get exposed to music in the first place? Yeah, so one thing that's been interesting for me is the fact that I also, I have no skills at all with music, obviously. And um, I've always seen, I've always seen myself as an observer, as a listener. And so I'm, I'm a, I love music. Uh, at first, uh, my friends actually introduced me to Lova music, and then I fell in love immediately. Um, that was like probably three years ago. Then um, I love Lova music so much that I, I just realized that it, it actually matches really well with anime, and there are some histories uh, on that too. But um, yeah, I was like, why don't I just start a page on Instagram and? There you go, Palatism was born. Um, then I just uh, post music that I like. At first, I actually, at first, I fell in love with Shiloh immediately. Uh, um, I yeah, mean, the, the OG. The OG, the best samples, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I fell in love with Shiloh at first uh, with, who was that? Like, Potsu? Sagan. Yeah, that's Potsu. I know you so well, that one. Yeah. And, and that just changes everything and you know the the real og like rookie and elijah who but um as time passes by i get to know a lot of uh new artists a lot of different producers uh, and especially one of them my one of my favorite platforms to listen to music even until now is actually soundcloud yeah SoundCloud is super underrated. Like you can, the algorithms are amazing. Like I can really find great music through SoundCloud. It's it's really hard for me to find great music algorithmically through Spotify. You know, like my yeah, I, I can see the playlist. I can I can search the playlist, but SoundCloud has been really interesting. I I've like a lot of producers. I've met a lot of producers because of SoundCloud, and. And I think a lot of people need to uh, touch more of SoundCloud, you know, because I think it's a great way to connect as well. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, so um, we're going to release music, right, together. Yeah. Um, through the, the record label, of course. Um, don't you want <laughs> to say? Right? Uh, I think it should be out the moment this, um, this podcast is out. And okay. I'm very excited about that. Oh, my God. It released and- today? <laughs> Yo. Today's the day. <laughs> oh my god. Congrats um, to us in the future. This is us in the past, technically, because we're <laughs> yeah. listening to this yes, of in course. the future. Um, but uh, one thing that uh, I really want to ask uh, to you is your music-making process. Um, a lot of people have different uh, strategies, I would say, to uh, making music. Um, so how does your music making process look like? Do you uh, make schedules, uh, you know, plans, uh, like every day I want to make uh, like five beats or so? Or right. do you lean more towards like uh, feelings and uh, do I feel like doing it today? And if not, like I can just postpone it tomorrow. Like which type of person are you? Okay, yeah, excellent question. I am 100% the latter. I'm much more of a feelings kind of mm. producer than a schedule kind of producer mm-hmm. i don't know if you're familiar with the legend kenny beats but his slogan is don't overthink shit and i subscribe to that <laughs> i just um i get up early in the mornings and usually i like to produce right when i wake up mm-hmm. uh, and then i like to produce as well like later at night but it's really just whenever i feel like it so you're you're both a morning and a night person yeah, yeah. I've like recently over the last couple of months, I've started setting like a, an early schedule and getting up like at at like uh, uh, seven a.m. and then jumping out of bed and getting on on uh, Ableton immediately. Yeah, and especially in the mornings, it your mind just is super fresh and yeah, you know, it's not clocked up, it's not clouded. Exactly. Exactly. There's no like information fog that's gotten to me yet. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't had to deal with like work stuff yet. And yeah, it's it's perfect. My brain is clear. It's not foggy. I'm ready to go. Get a coffee. I just start making beats. 
Yeah, and uh, especially with music, I agree with the fact that you you cannot just force it. Um, well, you can, but I think the results will differ very much. Right. It's um, like different strokes for different folks, man. If it works for you to set a schedule and like like Kanye said, you know, five beats a day for three summers, you know, that, that kind of thing. Yeah. If that works for you, then you do that. If it works the other way around, it doesn't matter, man. However it gets done. Yeah, and every person has like their own way of doing it. And so, yeah, of course, uh, self-awareness is very, very important. Um, right. Not just in music. I think in general to non-creative people, I mean, like people not working in the creative industry, people like professionals, I think it's really important to figure out what type of person are you and, and, and lean more towards your strength instead of like overthink your weakness. And I really love that because actually don't overthink yeah. things. And uh, <laughs> um, do you think a lot of artists or producers are overthinking uh, when they're making um, music? It depends where you're at, like in terms of your progression as an artist because i mean everyone overthinks to an extent at some points but i think producers who are either new to it or haven't quite found their stride yet tend to do overthinking more Mm -hmm. like i don't know when i produce or like when i watch uh producers who have been producing for a long time do it there isn't like a ton of tinkering you kind of like know where you want to go with a sound you you know like you, you experiment of course but I think a lot of like newer producers tend to get bogged down in details. And uh, that's something mm-hmm. that you kind of can ditch as you go along. But not everyone does. A lot of people stay like very, very detail oriented and spend tons of time on everything, even as they go. But that's also a different strokes kind of thing. Yeah, and uh, details are definitely important. But I think overall, everything is important. In, yeah, when in, I first started making music, I thought that like I had to learn how to like master and do a mix down first. Like that was like the first thing that I try. You know, like I was trying to tackle that all right at the beginning when I didn't even have any like sort of idea how to make chords or melodies or anything. And I think a lot of producers end up falling into that trap. I, I have a friend of mine who who did a similar thing. He is like trying to he's trying to learn how to master. And I, you know, it's fine if you want to like get into the into the technical side of things. If that's like specifically what interests you, then absolutely go for it. Do whatever the fuck makes you feel good. But um, I, yeah, I, I don't want people to get bogged down in the details. Just go do whatever do whatever you enjoy. It doesn't have to be perfect. Yeah, absolutely. I think what's the definition of perfection in itself, right? Right. <laughs> True. It's and sometimes like. It's not wrong, but that idea of perfection itself is just something in your mind. You know, maybe a lot of people, when they hear it, when they listen to it, it's not perfect. But, you know, that's totally okay as well. Um, but I think a lot of people overthink it. And in eventually, in the end, they don't produce anything. They don't make anything because they scrap everything up. And so... um do you make do you have a lot of your beats actually being scrapped and actually no one in the world will see it um that has like the that's evolved over time uh Mm. because like previously i would say that you know 99 percent of my beats no one will ever hear or songs no one will ever hear um but in like the last year and then especially in the last six months and then even more especially in the last like month or two i would say that a much greater volume of the stuff that i'm making is going to get out there um so how often do you make a music how often do you tinker around with um ableton uh right now i'm doing it basically every day unless i don't feel like it but which is pretty rare Mm -hmm. uh I'm doing like a song a day right now for the past like I don't know two wow. weeks. Sometimes it's every other day, but yeah, I just like try to do. I try to do one a day for now. Wow, that's some hustle right there. Yeah, and it's not like I'm trying. It's not like I'm like have the like I guess express goal of finishing a song every day. It's more like I get up in the morning and 
I just start on something. And the way I, the way I work is like quickly, and I like to do it a lot on instinct. So I end up mm. getting through them. Like I could do a song in about an hour, and then there's like you know tweaks and stuff that I want to do and different mixing things that I like here after I play it back a couple times. But yeah, yeah, I can get through songs pretty quickly. That's cool. That's cool. And and do you think uh, COVID and the quarantine season? I would say, do you think it actually makes you more productive in the sense of producing and making music? Um, it was like uh, kind of like how I said it being like there's been ups and downs. Producing mm-hmm. was definitely affected by COVID. Like at, at the beginning, I had to stay home for like a month. Uh, not at the beginning, beginning, but once things like got bad. I had to stay home for about a month and I wasn't able to go into work. And mm-hmm. so like the first two weeks of that was incredible. And I was doing like music all day, like 10 hours a day, 12 hours a day. <laughs> I was actually just sitting here making beats. Uh, and then my like, I don't know, it, it like it wanes as time goes on and you have less inspiration because you've been outside less. You've been, you know, your routine yeah. disrupted, but not necessarily in the most healthy way. And I started getting like a creative block for a bit. Uh, but then I got back to work, and a lot of stuff happened in my personal life. But I've just been trying to. I, I was able to refine that that sense of like motivation and get through that creative block, which has been really nice. About creative blocks, do you think it's because I I also uh, faced a lot of creative blocks recently, especially during these times, like you said, uh, because we. That's my curious about well, like we don't go out and. And we don't have a lot of ideas flowing in. And so, you know, I've been getting a lot of creative blocks lately. It's more of like, I don't feel like doing it, right? And 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 so how do you get over creative blocks? Do you think it's just time will play out in the end? Or do you think it's something that we can actually, there's a certain action that we can do to, you know, get rid of that? I think I think it'll vary person to person. But for me, there is stuff that I can do. It's just. Like the first time I think that I encounter the block, I don't like think of it as a block. Cause sometimes like I'll just go in, I'll start producing, I'll have a shitty idea and you know, I'm playing it back. I'm like, oh, that was not that great. All right, scrap it onto the next one. Um, but for me, I'm, first of all, I'm a people person. Like I am an extrovert in some senses and I like to be around people. I also like to be outside. I like going places. I want to get lunch with my roommate. I want to get, you know, dinner with my buddy. That's like, uh, I don't know. Those are like these small enjoyments in life are a big deal for me. And so COVID definitely made me feel, you know, kind of cramped and boxed in. But once I realized, hey, I can still go outside. We can go on hikes and we can spend more time together. Once I was able to like key in on those things, it was a lot easier to uh, get over the creative block. Yeah, I couldn't imagine it for extroverts because I'm an introvert and so like staying at home and you know like I I of, of course I gotta interact with people as well you know through video calls and and with my friends as well but I, sometimes I cannot imagine it for extroverts I have actually a theory that like maybe after the quarantine is over like extroverts are becoming introverts because of <laughs> <laughs> because of this whole thing but nah I mean I, I think you know, it's it's only a temporary thing. I believe that this is not the end. Hopefully, and and I believe that you know w- one day it will be over, and we're gonna uh, take a look back and see how oh, I actually, just went through it. The whole world just went through it, right? And like with that level of gratitude, I think it's gonna push us even further to you know make the best out of everything and 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 you know, do our best in everything that we do, you know, in music and uh, with our the quality time with our families and our friends. And and yeah, so. Yeah, I agree with you. I think, like, so I, I don't know where you are, but here, uh, where I am, I'm in America, and we're kind of like royally fucking this up. Um, yeah. So I don't know if we're going to be out of it quite yet. But I and I do think, by the way, that there is some truth to not that extroverts will necessarily become introverts, but I do think there is some truth to you know things will change after COVID. Like we will still take some things with us that we either mm-hmm. learned or unlearned during COVID. Uh, and I work in like for my job job, I work in logistics and operations management. Mm-hmm. And I'm already seeing like how 
businesses are going to change post COVID, even even once it's totally over. Yeah, and I'm actually from Indonesia, and we're at, this is what we call what's going to happen post COVID. We call them the new normal, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, it's yeah, the absolutely. new normal because like the the new normal means that the normal will change that there's so many new things that will finally feel like normal because because of everything that's been going on because it actually uh, triggers a lot of alarms especially with health and in in governments right in businesses need to adjust as well and a lot of industries are being affected and so I think it's this is why I think it's very important to to have adaptability uh, to be adaptable to different situations. And I believe that this is actually like a test. Like every will everyone will do this test and will go through it. And and you know it will play out in the end like whether you can make adjustments and changes and of course it's it's not going to be easy for everyone but i think it's really important because if you see history actually there are always changes even though like for me this pandemic really changes a lot of things but you know through times we've always been encountering um changes and i think um humans are able to adapt to those changes and sometimes it's about choices ultimately like we want to think about macro big stuffs but i believe that big stuffs come from very small little things and so i think it can start with what do we choose to do every single day like um do you choose to learn something new do you do you choose to make uh something productive do something productive or do you just escape and excuse the world and everyone else because you're not succeeding and you're not achieving the things that you want in life so yeah i think it's going to i think it's going to make the people who are strong-willed the people who are very mentally steady very ambitious to a very different level and i think it's going to be a big problem for um, people who do not believe in themselves. Oh man, yeah. Um, I hope I hope that those people. <laughs> I make hope it through they okay. Yeah. Check on your friends, everybody. But yeah, like I, one of the clients that we work with, they're a publishing company, and they own like twenty nine different publications across the country. They have this like giant space in DC, which is like a very exp- expensive place to have mm-hmm. a giant space, and. It's really fancy, and there's tons of people working there, and they're like shutting it all down. And when I talked to them, they told me that the COVID like kind of made them realize that they don't need to have any physical space at all. Everyone can just work from home. So I think the world will change pretty significantly. Like things will shift going forward. And I know for me, it was definitely like I said, ups and downs. And I, I don't know. I feel like I got like a little depressed during the COVID. I dealt with a breakup too, which was hard. But I think now that I've gotten kind of used to what COVID is and that it's here for a while, I'm making friends with it, you know? I, I picked up some new, some new positive habits and just trying to be, I think hopefully everyone's trying to be a healthier version of, of themselves when they exit it. A couple of days ago, actually, I posted about a, a post where um, I encourage people to share their deepest insecurities and in, in it's really heartbreaking for me to see the comments because of how I see so many people are facing through difficult times, you know, not just with the world, but with themselves. And to see a lot of people having their really deep downs in their lives. And, you know, from I have, I feel like I have a great accountability to help people because like, especially when you have a platform, I think, it's it's really important how we can help people out, especially during these times. And I, I saw a lot of people with um, depression and even suicidal thoughts that, um, you know, it's just, wow. Like, and these people are willingly to share all of it, you know, in social media. So for me, it's like, it must be really um, 
hard and, and difficult for them. And so, yeah, I think a lot of people do definitely need help. And I think for for us and for some people maybe who are fortunate enough in a good condition, you know, economically or um, just mentally and physically, I think we should be able to be, I would say, the light for them. We should be um, the salt, the salt and light for them, like helping them out because I, I cannot imagine a world where I only get to live for myself. Of course, like we all got to take care of ourselves. But for me, I think it's also about, you know, helping others, you know, serving others. And when we have the opportunity to help others, I think that is, you know, what makes life, that's what makes life meaningful for me, at least. It's not just to be selfishly happy for myself, but, you know, to make others happy as well, not, not uh, per se to like satisfy them. And, you know, because I want to satisfy people's uh, needs, but just because I see a lot of people that are hurting and, you know, I just want to help them. Yeah. First of all, I love the quote, you know this already, but I love the quotes that you put on your, on your posts and the discussions that you start. They're Uh so wholesome. and. I didn't see those specific comments, but yeah, it's heartbreaking, man, when people are, the insecurities that people acquire throughout, you know, whatever traumas and whatnot that goes out, goes on throughout their life. It is heartbreaking. A lot of those people have a ton to offer. They just haven't like fully realized it yet. I know a lot of people like that. As a friend of theirs, it's always your responsibility to push them in the right direction, help out as much as you can, because everyone has great things that they can offer the world. And also, I'm a big proponent of therapy. Even these hard times, everyone mm-hmm. should have therapy. Everyone should have get therapy in general, but mm. especially now. Yeah, and especially here in Indonesia, it's very foreign for us to talk about therapy. Like I think oh, really? there have been a lot of conversations in the U.S. and in the Western world, but here in Southeast Asia, we don't get to hear that a lot of times. I would say we're still a very conservative um, society. Of course, um, the younger um, people are they know a lot about that but i think especially with parents and uh the older generations in general they don't really talk about it you know yeah. it's the same old thing but you're yeah, absolutely I think, right i think it's really important you know to talk to a professional uh who understand about what you're going through yeah for sure and you're right about the generational thing uh, i know my dad has told me like I've asked him before if he's been to therapy and he was like, that, that concept is like completely foreign to him. Like he would never have even thought of it, uh, even in like hard trying times uh, or issues that he was dealing with. He would never have gone to a therapist and his grand and his dad certainly, you know, my grandfather certainly would never have gone to a therapist. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that like the idea surrounding therapy is changing. There's also like, I think there was a lot of like pride and masculinity wrapped up in it. Yeah. You know, not like being a weak person, but that's, mm-hmm. I think that those ideas are, are going out, out of the window, yeah. which is nice. I like that. So, uh, you know, I, I want this to be uh, something bold. Uh, do you have some advices for people out there? Maybe for those who are having their ups and downs, especially during these times, both uh, producers and just people living their lives, um, having their jobs and maybe having a lot of difficult times uh, during this uh, pandemic, do you have any advices for them? Yeah, I mean, listen, we, we, we all go through shit and it's important not to, I don't know, you don't want to invalidate the crappy stuff that you go through. I mean, it sometimes life just smacks you and that's all right. I like there's a, there's a term that comes from, that I learned from Overwatch. Whenever there's like, when you're, whenever you're behind, people always like to say, it's still winnable. It's winnable, right? Life, every situation, it's always winnable. Just make the best of it. Wow. That's incredible. Hey, you like that? I tied back in. <laughs> that is so good. Is that really from Overwatch? <laughs> no, I don't know where it originates from, but it's something that everyone, like, if there's like a really close fight that's happening, or let's uh... say you're down, or let's say you made an incredible comeback, everyone's always yelling, winnable, winnable, winnable. Right, and I take that into life with man. It's winnable. Yeah, that's a good takeaway, man. Like, there's the hope. Like, everything's yeah. possible. It's winnable. It's winnable. It's winnable. 
Yeah, man. I, I you know, I I'm sure the people that listen to this, if there are people that listen to Lo-Fi, a lot of you are familiar with like feeling melancholy and sad, but mm-hmm. or sad. I don't know. Everyone, you know, that listens to Lo-Fi, <laughs> is sad. but you know, those are like the feelings that are kind of like that the music is expressing a lot of the time. Um, but yeah, it gets better. That's amazing, man. So uh, do you have any shout outs to anyone uh, that you just want to share some love with? Yeah, I already said the word bound guys, but I'll say them again. Those, <laughs> those guys are great. And uh, Jalowo. Jalowo uh-huh. is the best. Yeah, that dude is the man. Uh, and Feverkin. If you haven't listened to Feverkin, go listen to him. Awesome. Nick, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure talking to you, you know, and I wish you all the best uh, for what is to come, for what's next uh, for you. And I also would like to thank the audience, everyone who has been listening up until this point. I wish you well. Please stay safe and take care. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.